Hello, everybody. We're going to give you a couple minutes to, to join the webinar, um, and we'll get started in just a minute. Welcome. We're excited to have you. As people um, well, trickle in, we would love to know where everyone's calling in from. Um, so if you can put in the chat where you are currently located, we'd love to share with our amazing guest where everyone is today. Let's see as people come in, go ahead and if you didn't hear, just drop in the chat where you're calling in from. Since we're remote, I'm sure everybody's all over the country. Chicago, Portland. And we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so hi everybody and welcome to Stanford Women in Business's Tech Week. For today's fireside chat, we are grateful to be joined by the incredible Julia Hartz. SWIB's director of Tech Week, Ashley, will be moderating our discussion today. But before handing it over to her, I wanna encourage you to submit questions at the event using the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll have time at the end to answer some of them. So with that, I wanna thank you all for joining us with special thanks, of course, to Ms. Julia Hartz, her team and SWIB for participating in and putting on this event today. I'll now pass it to SWIB's president, Brooke, for a few words. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for SWIB's first ever virtual Tech Week. Stanford Women in Business is the largest pre-professional organization for undergraduate women on Stanford's campus, and we are committed to providing education, community, and networking for rising female business leaders. Through workshops, conferences, company treks, and speaker series like this one, we strive to cultivate opportunities for mentorship, career guidance, and industry exposure. I'll now pass it off to SWIB's Executive Vice President, Casey, who will introduce our speaker. We are honored to learn from our distinguished guest today, and it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce Mrs. Julia Hartz. Julia is the co-founder and CEO of Eventbrite, responsible for the vision, strategy, and growth of the company. Under her leadership, Eventbrite has become a global self-service ticketing and experience technology platform that serves a community of nearly 1 million event creators around the world. Julia co-founded Eventbrite with her husband, Kevin Hartz, and their third co-founder, Renaud Visage, with a vision to build a self-service platform that would make it possible for anyone to create and sell tickets to live experiences. In addition to her passion for event creators, Julia is focused on cultivating a culture surrendered, centered around the company's mission to bring the world together through live experiences. In the spring of 2020, when the COVID-19 pandemic decimated the event industry, Julia led the company with swift and decisive action, focusing the team's effort in stabilizing the balance sheet. With the vaccine rollout underway, Eventbrite is preparing for the return of in-person events to catch that wave when it comes. Welcome, Julia. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's really an honor. Thank you so much, Julia. We are so honored to have you here today. Um, to start off, clearly you've had an incredible career that has taken you through many different roles. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are today? Sure. So I grew up in a small town called Santa Cruz, which for those of you who go to Stanford, you know Santa Cruz probably, um, and grew up dancing and was you know, really into competitive dance and hadn't really given a lot of thought into what I'd do beyond that. Um, in fact, my, my dance partner, my, we were a duo and she went on to have a, a really successful career. Uh, first she went to, she was on American Idol and then she went to um, be on Broadway. And so it's like sliding doors, you know, of course she was way more talented than I was, but um, you know, I, my parents are 
stepped in at some point and, and told me that whatever I did with my life, I'd need to go to college first. And that sort of pivoted my, my plans. I think my, my unmet uh, or unrealized goal in life was to be a backup dancer for Janet Jackson. So I'll always like have that, you know, as, as my unrequited dream. Um, I went to Pepperdine University down in Malibu and, and really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I wanted to go to a small school. I wanted to stay in California. I was used to living on the beach. Um, and so I ended up, I ended up at, at Pepperdine and um, in order to, to be at Pepperdine, I needed to have about three paying jobs. And um, I also discovered pretty quickly that uh, using, you know, using my position at a small university in Los Angeles would actually open up a, a bunch of doors for internships in the entertainment industry where they were pulling from the bigger schools of UCLA and USC. So, you know, coming from a smaller, smaller pool was, was advantageous. So essentially what that meant was I ended up focusing on television production as my major. Uh, and, um, I, took classes at night and I worked during the day. Um, I was, I shuttled kids around Malibu to like their different activities and worked as an assistant for a record executive and did all these sort of odd jobs. And I interned and I basically figured out what I wanted to do through a series of internships. I started on the set of friends, which was unbelievable from, you know, as a first internship ended up being the worst internship, um, despite it being really cool to be around Jennifer Aniston. And, you know, she was married to Brad Pitt at the time and the whole thing. It was awful. It was like endless hours. It was just, it, it, the culture was toxic. It was just, I knew that I didn't want to be in production uh, after that internship. I went on to, to um, intern at places like New Regency in their script library. And I realized that making a film takes sometimes a decade plus. And I just, I, I couldn't be in it for that long. I wanted to be in a fast paced environment. I finally landed after a few other internships, I landed at MTV in the series development department. And that really married a lot of what I wanted. It was cable, so it moved faster. It was um, business plus creative because as a, a series development department is basically a VC arm of, of the network. So you hear a bunch of pitches and you decide which ones to, to option, you develop that, and then you launch it into very few of them end up making it onto on air. And that's where I ultimately ended up after school. So um, I graduated on a Friday, started working as an assistant to the head of the department on Monday. Um, that kind of comes back into play later, later on. I, uh, I then go from, you know, MTV to FX networks, uh, where I worked on scripted shows like rescue me, the shield, um, nip tap, and also their reality show, uh, their foray into reality shows, which were shows you don't remember. Um, and while I was there, I went to the wedding of my boss from MTV who married a classmate of my now husband. From Stanford, um, they had been the groom was was his uh, his roommate at Stanford, and we met and fell in love at the wedding. So um, at that point, I started living this kind of double life where I'd go up to San Francisco to visit Kevin as he was building his second company, Zoom X O O M, and learn about you know everything that was going on in Silicon Valley that somehow I had missed growing up in Santa Cruz. And he would come down to LA and I'd take him to fun events like the MTV Movie Awards. Um, and he would learn a lot about Hollywood. Uh, I'm not sure that helped too much. Uh, but at any rate, after two years of doing that and seeing each other just on the weekends, we decided to make it official. And um, after much debate, decided to settle in San Francisco. And um, it was at that point that I was just, you know, really wanting to I needed a break from Hollywood. It was, I was pretty burned out at the, at the old age of 25 and, uh, and I wanted, but I did want to stay in, in content creation. And so I applied to a few startup cable networks up here in the Bay area. And, you know, it was like a square peg in a round hole. If you want to be in, in entertainment, you have to be in LA or New York. Um, and I got a job offer, but it was, was lower than what I'd been making in my like mid-level, you know, director level job at FX. And uh, 
I was sort of pausing, you know, about like hemming and hawing about taking it. And Kevin saw the opportunity to just come in and strike while the iron was hot and basically recruited me to start a company with him. And he said, you could go work on someone else's idea and make less than you're worth, or we can start something together. We'll make no money and we can put all of our savings into bootstrapping it. <laughs> and somehow, somehow I thought that was a good idea. So, um, that's how we started working together. And, uh, what I learned in the very early days of, of creating what became Eventbrite is that I love to learn by doing. I hate sitting in any sort of classroom environment and being talked at. Um, so that was a huge unlock for me. And everything that I did in the early days of Eventbrite, and still to this day, everything I do is basically all new learning. And um, it's on the job. And, uh, and so, you know, we started small, we found a third co-founder in Renault, um, who was our technical co-founder. And, uh, and we, we launched Eventbrite in 2006, which is a long time ago. That's awesome. That is such, such a great career journey. And so cool to come from, from LA and a whole different industry, you know, up until the Bay area. You know, obviously starting a, a company with your husband was a big risk. And you said before in prior interviews that you weren't born to be an entrepreneur. So can you tell us about what really motivated you to start Eventbrite and what that process in the early days was like? Well, I think the, I think the main lesson is to never typecast yourself or feel that you have to be the kind of poster child for something because I actually have never considered myself to be an entrepreneur. I'm, I'm a, I'm an operator and, you know, Kevin is a builder and an entrepreneur. I mean, he doesn't have the chip in his brain that says this might not work out. It's just completely missing. Like it, it is, you give him the most impossible scenario and he'll, he'll see how it could work and really can't see how, how it wouldn't work. So it's that, it's that infectious optimism and sort of blindness that I think allows entrepreneurs to put themselves in really precarious situations. And I was the like counterbalance to that. Not that I see risk in everything, but I love figuring out how to wire things and make them work and make them work faster and, and better. And I love story and I love building brand and I love creating customer communities and, you know, all, all of that. Plus, you know, with Kevin's skill set of, you know, being completely unafraid to take any risk was a really great combo. And so I think the lesson is that you don't actually have to be that, you know, classic entrepreneur um, to succeed. And I think this is a really important point that I'm going to pause on here because I go to Twitter and my feed is full of masculine toxicity. And I'm not trying to go like anti-man right now, but this is, I mean, it is absurd what is getting put out there by people that, you know, a lot of people look up to. And you would think with that, plus the wealthiest, you know, people on the planet, all being men, plus the heroes that we hold high on pillars, you know, we deify these founders, you would think that you have to be a man to succeed. I mean, if you just landed on this planet and looked at Twitter as like, as like your guide, you would be like, oh, I need to be a man. And I need to be like constantly super confident and putting out new ideas and claiming credit for everything. And I, people need to worship me, you know? And I, I just, I, I hope to at least give you a picture of someone who is none of those things and who has had a degree of success in, in her life and her career and, you know, in making a difference. So I think that's the important part is like, please, like, A, get off Twitter, Twitter, but B, don't think you have to be something in order to achieve your goals. Um, and the more of us that there are, the more normal it will become. And, you know, you really can't be it unless you can see it. So um, that's my, that's my rant for the day. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I mean, such great advice. And like you said, you saw on Twitter, sometimes it really does feel like you need to be a man to succeed. So having been so successful in your career, what advice would you offer to other female leaders and how can we prepare for the unique challenges that women face in the workplace? Well, I think, you know, for a long time, 
um, I felt that empathy was my greatest weakness because when someone walks into a room with me, I can immediately pick up on their energy and it, it takes a lot of energy for me to try to push that away. But it's also it, what I realized is that what I thought was my greatest weakness was actually my greatest strength. And, um, and I really, really appreciate that now that I don't have it right. Cause being virtual, you just don't have the same signal <laughs> and it's been tough. It's like, it's like, you know, doing, doing what I do, but with like an arm tied behind my back and being empathetic really for me has been my, my secret to success because I can meet whoever I'm talking to, whatever group of people I'm trying to sort of really get to follow me, I can meet them where they are. And because I, I can feel that energy and that pull and understand their intrinsic motivations a little bit easier than the average bear. So whatever your special, you know, skill is, um, always think about it as, as a strength because it's not weakness. I actually think being a female in business is a great advantage because when everyone's leaning to the left, you can lean to the right pretty easily. And that's, that's unique. And it's, and it's, it's helpful and it's, um, valuable. And, you know, and so I think that, um, I came up through, you know, this journey over the last 15 years with a very strong, ally and then a bunch of mentors around me, mostly men. So I definitely think that allyship can be as big or as small as just a, as just a small gesture of kindness. And I think it's, it's important to look around you and understand men and women, um, who, who are your allies and draw from them. But really, I think that helped me stay focused on what we were building and our customers and what we were doing for them more so than, than feeling, you know, like, oh, maybe I don't belong here. Um, I think that in some of, you know, there was a, there was a, an inflection point for me, particularly when I turned 30. So we started Eventbrite when I was 25, had our first kid. Then I was, I think about to have our second kid and I, and we just raised money. No, sorry. I just had one kid. We had just raised money from Sequoia Capital and I felt it was our first institutional round. And I kind of felt like they were going to tap me on the shoulder and be like, all right, it's been great. Like, go you. But, you know, it's time for you to move on because we're building a real company and you're just kind of random. Like you are married to the CEO and you're you have this random title of president. And we don't really know what you're doing to build value. I was convinced that was going to happen. And um, and that's that's not helpful. A, like if you're having those thoughts about anything, put them in a box, wrap them in a bow and put it on a shelf and do not open that box again. Um, but B, it actually helped me understand where my value was because I was having that thought. And I was also having a parallel thought around the fact that I felt for Eventbrite the same way I felt for our newborn baby, that I couldn't actually distinguish the two because I had helped create both of them. So there was this irrational loyalty and unconditional love that I had for the company. And then the third thought was we were about to raise $9 million. That felt like a huge sum. And we were going to grow our team from 30 to over a hundred in less than a year. And that felt like going from a team to a company and all around us, the cohort of 2005, 2006 companies were, you know, growing really quickly and sort of losing their identity and, or having to go back and like correct their culture mistakes as they grew, they were just getting sloppy and sort of letting it with like the, the wheels were falling off the bus. So I put all three of those <laughs> thoughts together and I came up with this idea of like, okay, wait a minute, if I would do anything. I would literally lay down my life for this company. And I am really good in this certain area. And this is an area that we could really blow it. Then that should be my special purpose. And so I came to Kevin and Renault and I said, you know, I think that now that we've found someone to run customer service and marketing and finance, which were all my functional roles when we were just a three person team, I think I should focus on the people and who we're hiring, how we're hiring, 
you know, I'm not a head of HR, but I think I should focus on our culture. And that, and they were like, great. You know, and, and my thought was like, I should come to the table of every major decision thinking about the Brightlings and how that's going to impact our greatest asset, which is Brightlings. And so I did that for a while. I did that for like six years before I became CEO. And that was my job. And it was like, and I'm so proud of what we built and who we are and why we are. But um, it was really a moment of great doubt that like kind of helped me get into gear on how I was going to help build the company. Now, never, ever, ever in a million years did I think I was going to be the CEO of the company. So that probably would have been too heady. I would have been paralyzed, but, um, you know, but I had 10 years under my greatest mentor, which is Kevin, uh, to, to get ready for that moment. That's such a great story of finding your value and really realizing, you know, how much you cared and how you could really use your, your skills to help the company. Um, I'd love to, you know, dig into the culture a little bit more. Eventbrite has consistently been voted one of the best places to work. So can you share a few insights, you know, how you were able to help cultivate such an amazing company culture? And also how do you, you know, th continue to think about this while people are working remotely? Well, what I've learned is that culture is the manifestation of the people who are in your company at that given time. And because of that, it constantly evolves because people are coming and going and changing and growing. And, you know, it's, it's, they come from different places and bring their, their ideas with them and their blueprints of what, how it should be, or how they've, they think it might, or how it shouldn't be. Um, so it, if you think about it that way, it's more like a, it's more like an amoeba and it's not, you know, like if people constantly say, how do you preserve a culture? And I, I say, well, I don't want to preserve a culture. That's like a bug stuck in amber. You know, you want it to be able to grow and flex and really rise to meet the challenge of any time because a, a, a healthy culture is one that's reinforcing and a healthy culture is one that's self-healing. And a healthy culture is one that roots out things that don't serve the business or the culture without it having to be, you know, sort of found on its own. Like, you know, it, it just, it, it's very obvious. And um, a, a, a healthy culture is not one that subscribes to the same ideas over and over again, even if they don't resonate or they don't serve the customer or the business. A healthy culture is not one that deifies its, founder and CEO. <laughs> a healthy culture is not one that, you know, only gives access to certain, certain types of people. And, um, you know, one that, that wants you to just do it a certain way and, and isn't interested in what you can bring to the table and doesn't foster curiosity. So I think I just always have had that feeling of like, what would be the healthiest culture that we could build? Not the best, not the most fun, not like the coolest, you know, but like the healthiest. And that's that, you know, the flip side of that. So that worked really well in building Eventbrite. And then it really suffered. Like our culture has been both incredibly strong, but also in ways, but also has suffered in the last few years. And the reason why it's suffered in the last few years is because we took our eye off the ball. We got, you know, it was like a big eyes, small stomach. We got really, really excited about the progress that we were seeing in the business. And we started taking on more. We acquired a huge company that had a totally different culture than our own. We um, went public. We, you know, just kept growing and building and, and, and kind of like, like putting all these pieces on it. And it just, it was like, we were like buckling under the weight of all of that. So we came into COVID not great, not, not, the, not the healthiest that we could possibly be. And it took COVID to like to correct that. And, you know, it's not lost on me that we are a remarkably stronger company from structure to strategy, to culture and people, um, than we, than we have been in a very, very long time. And that, you know, it's hard to say that it was worth it, but it, gosh, like the benefit of going through this, through this last year is immense. And the energy to rebuild our company and rebuild the industry with all the lessons that we've learned, um, you know, it's, I mean, you can tell it's like, it's infectious. It's, it's what keeps us going every day. 
Now, having a culture, having a culture like ours that really benefits from people being together in real life, it's very difficult to be, to be virtual. Um, for like the first six months, I didn't notice because I was so focused on saving the company. But in the last three months, it's become very tiring for me to be constantly looking at these boxes of people rather than being physically in the space with them. So, you know, we hope to uh, bring back our office hubs. We have a menu of options that people can choose from. You can be a, a remote link. So you are going to work remote, you know, always you're going to be a flex link where you can come in two to three days a week and you work in like a common area or you could be a hubling, we call our offices hubs, um, where you have a dedicated desk and you come in three to five days a week. And I think that that program really honors the fact that work has changed forever. We're never ever going to go back to the way we used to work before, but that you can evolve over time and you can choose your path. And um, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, I still think we're quite a ways away from, from getting back together in the office safely and in, in the way that we want to. But um, I have optimism that we'll see that happen, you know, within the year. That's great. And it's, you know, it's remarkable to hear that COVID actually, you know, helped improve the company culture. And obviously it must have taken lots of work, um, not only to save the company, but to improve it over this pandemic. So I'd love to hear what that was like and how you adapted to, to COVID while staying true to the core values and mission of Eventbrite. And, you know, you said, you're, you're kind of having these flexible work environments. What else, you know, what other changes do you think will endure even after the pandemic and life returns to normal? Well, I think the biggest lesson I learned during this time is how critical it is to stop and ask yourself, what would you do if you could do it all over again? And that, that question is such a great unlock to any situation where you need to completely rethink or where, you know, what you were doing is most certainly not going to get you to where you want to go. Um, and that for us was the big, you know, was the big moment where we knew um, undoubtedly that our business would be, you know, I mean, COVID tried to kill our business. And so, you know, it was, it was undeniable for us. We, we went from 30 million in revenue in a month to negative 7 million, which meant that we processed $7 million of refunds more than the revenue that we generated. And that's because all live gathering stopped. You know, it's not, it's not every day that you, the basis of a freedom of a, something like freedom of assembly is something that gets taken away, right? For the greater good of, of global health, but still like that had not been the disaster that we were prepared for. They, they talk about scenario planning and tabletop exercises. And I can assure you nothing I've had ever come that close to, to, what we were about to face in March of last year. So, um, you know, everything was on the table. I mean, it was almost like because it was so severe and so swift, uh, there were no questions as to whether or not we needed to act and act fast. And so within a month of COVID hitting our, of that wrecking ball coming to our and hitting our business, we had restructured the company. We had we pivoted our strategy toward what we knew we would do if we could do it all over again. We restructured the company to fit that strategy. We took over $100 million out of our annual operating budget. And we raised a couple hundred million to help us survive however long we would be in this, in this state. Um, and because we moved so quickly, we just had such a huge benefit um, of being able to spend the rest of the time working on retooling, reimagining, reinventing, rebuilding. We have not let, it's kind of like, you know, near death experience. And then you have a new lease on life. Like we just never stopped. So we operate on such a different level now than before. And that's only going to get stronger and stronger, right. As we start to get back together in person, as the business, as our industry starts to come back and as we, our customers start to rebuild the live experience economy, and if we hadn't had that, if we hadn't had that hugely traumatizing experience, we, we wouldn't be where we are today, but, uh, but not by a long shot because we were over, over our skis, you know, on, on commitments. Um, so personally, because I feel this way about the company and, you know, view it almost as like my firstborn, it definitely felt 
like our kid was in the ICU. And we're so, so grateful to not have had that experience during COVID um, of a loved one being in the ICU. But the experience to me felt like it would be if I had a loved one in the ICU. And making decisions like having to cut off limbs to save the kid was exactly what our layoffs felt like to me. I mean, it was just such a deeply personal um, and professional, like really difficult time. Uh, it was like it was like waking up to a nightmare every day. So it, it only recently in the last six months has gotten fun, but the first six months were not very fun. Um, but you know, the I think the the second thing I I learned through that sort of headline first being, you know, asked that question early, what would you do if you could do it all over again? The second one is that, you know, when you just, when you think you're the only one in the world who cares as much about this thing or this company, you find out that there's, you know, for me, there was like 50 people in the company who cared literally as much, if not some days more than I did about saving our company. And that was a real breakthrough for me because I had spent all these years thinking, well, nobody cares as much as I do. People keep coming and going and, you know, I'm still here and I would do anything for this company. And that's just not true. I'm not alone in that. So I don't feel alone anymore. I used to feel like this was a really lonely job and I haven't felt lonely in a really long time. Um, and so that's been a huge benefit as well. So I think, I think some total, I would say that I could go on and on about the lessons that we learned in hindsight. I view everything as an opportunity. And I regret nothing in this, in this process. Um, I wish I would have been more transparent sooner with our company about how devastating it could be. Um, that's the one thing I would have changed. And everything else I feel like was led to the next thing, led to the next opportunity. And we just, we continue to benefit from the hard work that we've done. I love that. I love how optimistic you are and, you know, being able to take such a, you know, potentially devastating event and really turn it around um, is incredible to hear. I think, you know, the story of Eventbrite has had many chapters and you've gone through many changes, but most of the time, you know, you don't have something so striking and huge and devastating as a pandemic. So when do you know when it's time to make a change and forge into a new chapter? Um. You know, I think the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting to see different results. So anytime you're in that in that realm, I would say take a step back and ask yourself these these questions and start to start to blank canvas the problem. Um, you know, I think that that we had to learn how to fly blind, and that was not a skill that we had in our tool set because we're a data driven company. We love to verify things with data. We love to validate our theories with data. And we love the way that data can help us help our customers drive their business. So, you know, we did not, I mean, to use another analogy, all of a sudden we were in complete a uh, category six storm and we had no idea where we were going and we had to like throw the mast over and, you know, it was not, it wasn't, we couldn't, we couldn't stop to analyze everything. So we had to really dig in and rely on our gut intuition and our knowledge of our customers, our knowledge of the business. And we had to move, we had to act. And, and, and again, like that was for the betterment of our customers, because we acted so quickly, we could then turn our attention from, okay we're going to be solvent. Now, how do we help our creators? Because they're experiencing the biggest business disruption and, and most devastating blow. I mean, these are, our customers are the fabric of small businesses in America. And these are music venues. These are teachers. These are artists. These are people that have been completely, have had the rug pulled out from underneath them. So we wanted to then get to work on what we could do to help them survive and to help them get through this. Um, and one of that, one of the ways that our creators showed us they were gonna get through this was by pivoting their events to online. And that became a huge opportunity for us almost overnight. It, online events are up 20X on our platform. And um, you know we've just seen so many different formats and, and types of events that have emerged during this time. 
And then also when markets were easing restrictions, event creators are doing really, really creative things with their events. There are a few few of my favorite examples are, um, there was a, a music festival in Colorado that switched from you know the classic sort of music festival format to a three-day, two-weekend, three-day drive-in concert series. And that was last summer. Um, and they sold out immediately. They sold even more tickets than they would have for their festival. Another one is a uh, um, called Seltzerland, and it's from um, Kate Levenstein, who is this amazing event entrepreneur. She created a nationwide festival called the Beer and Bacon Festival, and she had to shut down all of her festivals when COVID happened. And she was out golfing with her dad, like basically going, "Okay, so now my entire career is over." And she had this aha moment that golf courses all over because the golf course they were on was about to close the next week to the public. And she had this aha, like, Oh, golf courses are going to be empty. I could do an event on a golf course and have everybody socially distanced. So she launched seltzer land, which was a hard seltzer tasting festival where you arrived with your group, you know, masked and the whole nine yards, you had like a, a maximum of six people. And you basically went to each tea and tasted hard seltzer and, you know, like walked the course. And I mean, those examples of people who just took like the worst circumstances, not only made it happen for their own business, but brought people together during such a critical time where we're all socially isolated. I mean, that's just, there's, there's thousands of those on Eventbrite. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully you can build something or be in a company that draws inspiration from its customers. And that's what we do. We just watch what they're doing and then we make the product better for what they're doing. And we just try to fast follow and make it faster, better, you know, more effective for them to use our platform to operate their business. But they're really in charge. I mean, they're the content creators. That's great to hear. I love that, you know, you're able to go back and forth with your customers and really support each other. And that golf course event sounds so fun. That would, I'd love to attend that. Um, I have one more question for you before we head into some rapid fire and then audience Q and A. Um, I'd love to hear, what do you recommend to students like us who may have a big idea for a startup and want to start a company? And how should we, you know, plan for success in the future? A few things. So first, just to find a co-founder. I really don't recommend going at it alone. I think that there is nobody out there who has all the skills it takes to be successful as, as, a, as a single founder. I think you really, really do suffer if you don't find a good co-founder. Because the way that Kevin and I worked is, and with Renault as well, but there was really a yin and yang aspect. And so, you know, while I was the operator and Kevin was the entrepreneur, um, you know, it was, it was helpful to have that tension and to have that support so you're not alone because it can be really, really lonely. The second thing is to know and expect that you have to start small. Every single idea, every single company has started small. Again, with the Twitter example, we tend to only focus on the like 0.000001% of companies that have had hockey stick growth. And we we think we can emulate that. And that's like a turkey in a tornado. Like you don't, you don't like set up for that. Um, and so knowing that everything starts small, even Eventbrite, you know, it's like an overnight success, 15 years in the making. I would rather have a company that is going to be able to survive the most devastating blow known to business <laughs> uh, and rebuild even stronger than one that explodes overnight and then has to like keep putting up the same numbers that like, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's very, um, it is um, like empty calories. And I always think about that. Like it's so think about what you're building and get it right in a small way and then build from there. Don't be like lured into raising a bunch of money and pouring that into acquisition costs. And then you all, all of a sudden have like, you know, a bunch of mouths to feed and you have to like charge your customers a bunch to then pay for the acquisition costs. It just, it spirals. And um, while I've had a really wonderful experience with venture capital 
coming from, you know, coming from this, this relationship that we've had with Sequoia, there's a lot of gotchas in that world. And so I just wouldn't be too quick to go out and raise. Like, I think that you can get a lot farther than you think not raising money or just raising family and friends round or angel investment round, then going after the big VC name. Like, it, yes, it helps to validate your business, but it's, but if you do it too fast, you're really going to be at the mercy of, of the venture firm. And if it's not the right one, then that can be disastrous. I know more people nowadays who have made that mistake and, and ultimately ended with them not being the CEO of their company or their company not being around. So I just would, I would tread carefully on that. And then the third, the final thing is do what you love. I mean, you know, life is too short and we all say that I know I sound like a mom, but do not something, do not do something that you're not passionate about because the amount of time and energy and sacrifice that you will make in this process is only possible if you love it. And so, um, don't do what you think you should do, do what you want to do. That was so cheesy. Oh my God. I'm so glad I love it though. Home right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. And definitely some, some really awesome advice. Um, I have a couple rapid fire questions for you. So to start okay. off favorite way to relax. Oh, I take a bath every night. Awesome. What about favorite book? Ooh. Um, Oh, there's a, oh God, I have so many because I love, love, love to read, but um, I really love Overwhelmed by Bridget Schulte, which is about how we use our time and it's about gender roles. And um, I think that's really worth a read. I love, randomly, I just read an amazing Stephen King. It's not random because Stephen King's amazing, but I'm not into scary stuff, but 112263 is an incredible time travel book. And speaking of time travel, my favorite romantic book is Time Traveler's Wife. And then my favorite author growing up was Maeve Binchy. And that's why I named my, my youngest daughter Maeve. So that's just a smattering of, of books. But I have a lot of, I love books. My mom's a book editor, so. That's awesome. Yeah, no, so many, so many great recommendations are need to add to my list. Um, the next one is what was your childhood dream job? Oh, backup dancer for Janet Jackson. I mean, still is. And I, Janet Jackson was the last concert we went to. And I think given how old she is that I could do it. Like, I think, I think, I think that I could, I could, I still have moves and she's getting older. And so it's like, I, I really, I'm not going to give up on the dream. That's awesome. Well, are, are we looking out for you in the next couple of years? So Amy Watch your space. I will. <laughs> Any new quarantine hobbies or habits you've picked up? We have, um, Kevin and I have just completely given in and we are living um, like the silver haired retirement dream. We have a cocktail together every night and play backgammon. Then we go and work on our puzzle. Um, if we're really feeling wild, we'll play some Yahtzee. And I have started to play the piano again, but I only play the piano. I only play pop songs. So right now I'm working on Exile by Taylor Swift and Bonnie Bear. And, um, and I have a cocktail. I, the cocktail seems to be the, the constant thing. So I drink more, I guess, but I have a cocktail during my lesson, which is virtual with my piano teacher. And I only play pop songs. So it's like, um, it's just, it's really joyful. That is awesome. That sounds so fun. Um, what is your, what's your guilty pleasure? <laughs> Cocktails. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Oh, I mean, you know, it's, I don't really have, oh, what is my guilty? I, I wish Coco could tell me what my guilty pleasure is. Shopping online after 10 PM after I've had a cocktail. That's, that's a big one. Yes. I haven't done it as much because I have nowhere to wear these clothes. So, um, so oh, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, I know daily mail. I read daily mail in the bathtub. Like it's horrible. It's just the worst thing you could possibly read. And I do it. And I have so much random knowledge because of it, probably all fake incorrect news, but I have it in case you need it. 
Good. I'm, you know, takes up important real estate in your brain, I'm sure. Um, great knowledge. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, who is your role model? <sighs> who is my role model? Oh. I mean, you recently just, we recently just hosted Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis at Eventbrite. And I would say she's my new role model. I mean, someone who has just seen so many hard times has been a voice for so many people whose voices aren't heard, who, you know, spent, I had no idea she spent over a year in jail um, back in the seventies. Uh, so I think people like her, I mean, I just, I find so I guess instead of having one role, role model, because I think humans are flawed. And if you put someone up on a pedestal, you're, you're bound to be disappointed. Um, I just find pieces of people that I think are just so exceptional. And um, she comes to mind for me. That's awesome. The final question I have for you is what is the best advice you've ever received? I, can I say that I hate this question? Just, just, sure. I, I love you, Ashley, but I hate the <laughs> All good. Coco, There's nothing wrong with that. On, I, gotta, I gotta phone a friend. Coco, what's the best advice I've ever received? Ah, <laughs> okay. So Coco, for those of you who are like, who is Coco and what is happening? Cause you can't see her. She's, she is um, my everything, but she's my chief of staff. She's was my assistant for four years and just was recently promoted into the chief of staff role. And the reason why is because she is my brain and, um, her, her, it, my advice is be the CEO of your own company, which I'll tell the backstory on. So, um, my husband had been running our company as CEO. I was president and he got sick and he had it. He had to step away from the business and to take care of his health. And, um, I was like furiously trying to figure out how to find a replacement CEO without it being a big deal. And, you know, it was just like trying to take care of him and that, and it was really, really stressful. And I went to lunch or I went to breakfast with one of my, my, uh, village members, my, my, one of my mentors, Jana Rich, who is, uh, an executive recruiter in, in, um, in Silicon Valley. And, um, and she, I, I was laying this out for her, you know, very confidentially telling her what was going on. And she said, she just leaned over the pan. I'll never forget. I was having pancakes. That's how stressed I was. She was leaning over the pancakes and said, you need to be the CEO of your own company. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, you're right. And I, it's not, I'm not trying to be cute. I really hadn't thought of that. Like it, it didn't dawn on me that that would be the, that's the thing that I should do. You know, like I was trying to find someone who knew more than me or had it, you know, and she was just like, no, that has to be you. So yes, that was the best advice that I had. Thank you. Thank you, Coco. <laughs> you, you may have said you didn't like the question, but it, it was an awesome answer. I so. know, I know. I just, ugh, I yes. just suck at these rounds at these speed rounds. <laughs> no, you were great. I think I you this was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for being so open and honest. And with that, I'll pass it over to Alex to lead us in some audience Q&A. Thanks. Hi, Julia. This has been so interesting and I've loved so much of what you said, as I'm sure many of the audience members can agree with. But there's been a number of questions we've gotten. Um, so I'll just start with the first one. Um, Emily asks, Julia, you seem incredibly resilient and positive. How do you balance optimism and realism in your leadership style? Well, I think that I am actually quite a realist. Um, you know, where Kevin is like the outsized optimist, I always look at like, what could go wrong? What do we need to be prepared for? You know, one, um, another great mentor said during this crisis, you can't predict the future, but you can prepare for anything. And so we really took that motto to heart out of Eventbrite. Um, and, you know, I think that, I think that what I, what I do is I typically look at any mistakes I've made as lessons learned, and I never make the same mistake twice, or I, I, I aim to do that. So I think I am, um, I'm aware that we have this one precious life. And I'm aware that, you know, we have, we are all, everybody on this Zoom is so fortunate 
to be where they are, but they also, you also have worked so hard to get here that the skills that got you here are going to get you to the next place, to the next place, to the next place. But just how fortunate we are to really have choice and agency in what we do. And I think of everything as an opportunity to continue to get better. So I'm just like, I'm an addict to, for improvement and, and forward motion, evolution, and you know getting better and learning more and continuing to, to build and strength. And so I think that's just what causes me to look at the glass half full or see the opportunities in a hard situation. Um, resilience, I think, comes from the work ethic that my parents instilled in me. And, you know, I've been working a job, like getting a a paycheck since I was 14. And um, I think that has to do a lot with why I show up every day and, and can keep doing it time and time again. And then the passion, you know, like it's not, um, it's not lost on me that not every founder gets to be the CEO of their company. I actually don't think that it, that should be a foregone conclusion, but I'm really happy that I did take that advice because I am the best person to steer this company through this time and into the next era. And that feels pretty cool to me. It feels like, wow, I, I still, I still can't believe this is where my life is and that I get to wake up every day and work on something that I love that I helped co-create. So, um, so yeah, I guess I, I, I guess I don't really know where it comes from, but I'm happy that I have these sort of reinforcing attributes that keep me going, even, even in the darkest of times, of course, there've been, there've been many in the last 12 months. I love that. And I think that's so important to think about for each of us in such a difficult time, as you're saying, um, to just take it in stride and look at the opportunity that comes from it, um, no matter where we are in life. Yeah. And when all else fails, by the way, because we've all been to the brink in the last year, just put one foot in front of the other. Like it doesn't, you don't have to boil the ocean. You just need to get one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. And that's eventually you're going to get through it, you know? And so I don't know, that sounds, it's easier said than done. That's for sure. No, I think that's still wonderful advice. Um, Susie from the audience asks, is it or was it, I guess, challenging to work with your husband? And I want to add on as well, how did that, how did blurring work in personal life, I guess, was that, was that something you saw day to day or did you make a very clear distinction? Uh, Was that challenging or supporting in your role um, throughout the business? I mean, sometimes it was hard to work with my husband, especially in the last, you know, especially as we, we kind of got back, we got the gang back together to save the company in March, April, and May. And there were definitely moments where I felt like, oh my God, who else has the previous CEO and chairman literally right next to them, like, you know, judging their every move. But that was really me. That wasn't, that wasn't so much him, you know, it was me feeling sort of that, that, that sense of, of, I don't know, self-confidence loss. Um, Net, net, I was very lucky to have him next to me and dropping everything to help me save the company. That was incredible. I couldn't have done it with, I really couldn't have done it without him and, and, you know, him supporting me. Um, But I think that, uh, you know, I think that that it depends on who you are. I mean, it's like any co-founder relationship. There are going to be ways in which you guys are really strong and ways in which you guys are really challenged. The way that Kevin and I view our partnership in life is that it's a forever one. And so, which is funny because my parents got divorced when I was two and had a really healthy relationship. And I kind of grew up in this like hippie commune environment, Santa Cruz. And I just thought you get married, you have kids, maybe you stay married, maybe you don't, you know, like, and so it's kind of funny that I, I just figured that I wouldn't be with the same person forever. And I think, I think we're lifers. Um, but I think that we make decisions in that way. Like we constantly are working on our communication. We're constantly working on how we support each other. Um, and through being co-founders, that's been an excellent way to do that. I mean, we just, you have to establish good communication. You have to be, you have to establish trust. You have to admire each other's, you know, uh, like strong suits and forgive each other for your flaws. It's just, there's, there's no way around it. So it's been reinforcing for us. It's been fun. It's been helpful to have one main passion and priority in our family because 
our kids don't know any different. And, you know, during, during the darkest months of COVID in those first 90 days, they were practically orphaned because of it. And that really, I think, taught them a good lesson that the world doesn't orbit around them. And they were so in it, like with us, just completely supporting us and worrying about Eventbrite too. And, thinking about the people that worked at Eventbrite. And I just, I'm, I'm so happy that that's that, that they've had that, that exposure and, um, you know, they feel like it's, it's their big extended family. So I highly recommend it if you can do it. I love that perspective. And I think, you know, regardless of the relationship, uh, you have with, whether it's your co-founder, you know, a teammate yeah. on your uh, soccer team, those types of traits are so important to be building. So I, I thank you for that. I think we have time for one more question before we wrap it up for today. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, given your historic investing, it seems like you're interested in education. What do you think about the future of education and what excites you about it? Well, I think that, um, you know, I think accessibility to education is, is really important. Um, we, before we started Eventbrite, actually, we went, my parents had been volunteering in a, at an orphanage in Thailand that had um, that had basically been around long enough that the orphans were now the teachers of the education program. And they were set up in the slums of Bangkok where basically it was just like the self ring for, they didn't do adoptions. It was a community, it was a self-sustained community. And seeing the power of education, of taking big, huge swaths of kids from the slums. And, you know, some of them live there and were orphans, but some of them, and because their, their parents had died from AIDS or from, you know, from other awful diseases. And, you know, they lived full time in the orphanage, but a lot of them lived with their families in the slums and were educated in, in the, in the orphanage and it's called Mercy Center. Um, and so having that exposure over the decade or so that my parents were involved in, it really gave me the firsthand knowledge of the power of access to ed education. And, um, and so I hope to do more in that space. I hope to, you know, Kevin and I like to invest in the, in the, like the kind of more fringe, like, un, like, um, we very rarely jump on a bandwagon, right? Like we like to invest in things that are kind of fund the things that are unfundable. And so, um, you know, I think that that work around uh, around strengthening access to education, um, especially for girls around the world, is something that I am super passionate about. And you know, as as I continue on, um, I hope to to be more involved with and and to do sort of greater, bigger impact moves there. Thank you for that beautiful explanation. Um, I, I wanna be the first, of course, to thank you for joining us today. Um, we cannot thank you enough and for all your Aww, wonderful insights. Thanks for having me. This was um, fun. Yeah, it was so exciting for us as well. So um, before we jump off, I just wanna give everybody in our audience a quick reminder that spring internships applications are now open. Um, this year we are offering both part and full-time internships in a variety of different industries with roles open in tech, finance, marketing, social media, and much more. So please visit stanfordwomeninbusiness.com slash spring internships for more information and to find the application link. Otherwise, I just wanna thank you on behalf of SWIB um, for joining us today, Julia. We've loved it so much, so. Take care, everybody. Good luck. Bye everybody, thank you so much.